Moving on. The main part of our session today is about um, transformers. And namely, we're going to look at um, the what's, what I call the ideal transformer. If you want to take one of them, Randy, and pass the rest around, please. Um, so we're going to look at basic transformer operation, which largely is revision of what something that probably went before a long time ago, BTEC, HNCs, foundations, etc. What the assumptions are when we consider an ideal transformer, anything below this level that I've that are taught transformers in, we only ever work with what we call an ideal transformer. Never really talk that much about what the assumptions are being made when you make a transformer ideal. But today we'll be doing that. Okay. Um, then we'll look at the technique of impedance ratio or what the reflected impedance is. So that's about when you connect a load to the secondary of a transformer, what impedance does the generator see that's connected or a source see that's connected to the primary side? Okay. And then having gone through that impedance ratio thing, we can use the technique of reflected impedance to actually solve transformer problems. So we can we can effectively remove the transformer from the circuit by reflecting impedance across and then moving them back again afterwards to get the values on the secondary. So we're going to go through that process today and there's um, some tutorial questions, usual sort of format. So that's largely today's session. So, transformers. IC circuits. We're talking about power circuits here, big loads that is the factory, this college, okay, they're supplied from AC circuits that are connected together using transformers. That gives us the ability to step voltage up and down, step current up and down, and change between a three-wire and a four-wire system. What we've been looking at the last three or four weeks is star and delta systems. One system is a three-wire system. One system can be a four-wire system and give us two dual voltage. The coupling between circuits connected via transformers, we've got a magnetic coupling between two circuits. No direct electrical current flows between them. So in certain places, transformers can also be used as isolating devices. And the most common domestic use of that is your shaver socket in your bathroom where the secondary is completely isolated and not earthed and therefore is completely safe in that respect. It allows for a high voltage low current circuit to be connected to a low voltage high current circuit and vice versa. The efficiency of transformers is normally very high, greater than 98% leading to minimal energy losses. No convenient equivalent of a transformer for a DC voltage. I mean, you're going to look at how DC voltage can be um, transmitted at high voltage, HV, DC, in terms of high level distribution, but down at low levels, there's no, um, no real comparison for the transformer for DC circuits, unless you do something with electronics to achieve it. Transformers play a major role in our electrical power distribution, relatively easily allow for efficient distribution through high voltage. Okay, so that's the basics of transformer. So, what we do is consider first a coil pass an AC current. The result is that a change in magnetic field is created around the coil. Okay, so this board is, is very static in it can't show really that 
that field is changing, but 50 times a second, that the current flowing through that coil is changing direction twice, and therefore the field is building up in one direction with the north at the top and south at the bottom in one half cycle. So it builds up to a peak, falls away to nothing. In the other half cycle, this would become north and that becomes south. So I like to think of that field building and collapsing. And when it does that, the lines of force are cut and across the conductors in that coil and they induce an EMF within that coil. So that's a basic single AC coil there. Okay? Produces a flux that is changing all the time. The only time it isn't changing, if that's the AC waveform, is at those two points. So there's no induced voltage at those two points. The highest induced voltage is where it crosses the zero line here, because the slope is the biggest. Yeah. If we want to develop that into a transformer, we do that when we place a second coil in close proximity to the first one. So the first one's got its AC voltage input, producing this change in magnetic field. Okay. That change in magnetic field now is the lines of force in that are cutting across the turns in the second coil and inducing a voltage and a current to flow. If we connect a load here so that a current flows, in that, so we've got a closed circuit in there. The induced voltage in this side is going to cause a change in current flow. So we've got a change in current flow in that side, induces a change in current in this side, which creates a field around here. So we've got what's called mutual induction between the two coils. So we end up with a measured voltage at the secondary, but there's no current flow directly between this coil and this coil, because they're not electrically connected together. So they're coupled magnetically. A simple method like two coils just in close proximity to each other would be extremely inefficient. So you need to maximise the magnetic flux from the primary coil that actually interferes with the secondary coil. So you need to get as much of that working together as possible to make the most efficient transformer design. The way that's done is the two windings are wound around an iron core. And quite often, in actual fact, that will be an iron core on a basic transformer shaped like so with both coils being wound over top of each other in that sec centre section. So you effectively got them as close as they can possibly be with a good laminated iron core magnetically coupling them together as well. Okay, so here's our primary over here with an AC voltage applied, produces a magnetic flux within the iron core around there that interferes with the mag with the um, cores of the, the conductor in the secondary and induces a voltage at these terminals here. Okay, and we talk about primary voltage, primary current, primary number of turns on the coil, secondary voltage, secondary current, secondary number of turns on the coil. The core is usually ferromagnetic, i.e. made of iron or other, some other 
ferrous material to make it magnetically um, of low reluctance. So reluctance is the magnetic equivalent of um, resistance. So it's how much, how well that piece of material will support a magnetic field. And a reluctance of an iron core is quite low. So that it's, it's much, much, much lower than the surrounding air. So that magnetic field is going to do any, everything it can to travel through iron rather than travel through air. Yep. The other thing that he's done, and you probably all know this if you looked at a transformer core, it's made up of laminations. So instead of just being one solid lump of iron, it's made out of laminated steel plates that are insulated away from each other. And what that's to do with is to reduce the effect of what's called eddy currents. You get currents set up within the, within the iron core that cause it to heat up and become a, a waste of energy. If you insulate the plates from each other, then you're less likely the currents are going to go round it rather than within it. Okay? So, from Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, we can say that the voltage induced in the primary side, V1, is equal to N1, the number of turns on the primary side, multiplied by D theta over DT, with theta being the amount of flux. Yeah. So it's the rate of change, this bit here, rate of change of flux. Find some room here. That is flux. N is your turns. And then you've got on the primary side and the secondary side. The voltage on the secondary side is equal to the number of turns times the rate of change of the same flux. That flux is the, is the flux that is common to both coils. It's the mutual flux. More about flux that isn't common to both coils a bit later on. Okay? So, this magnetic flux is common to both coils. Hence, what we can say is the two fluxes cancel each other out and we can say that the ratio of the voltage to the number of turns on the primary side is equal to the ratio of the voltage and number of turns on the secondary side. Equally, we can say the ratio of the two voltages is equal to the turns ratio. N V1 over V2 is N1 over N2. I.e., the ratio of the primary and secondary voltages is equal to the ratio of the primary and secondary turns. Okay. Now, to complete the analysis of what is still an ideal transformer, we need to say that if it's ideal, it will be 100% efficient. And hence, the apparent power is also preserved, meaning that the apparent power on the primary side, S1, must be equal to the apparent power on the secondary side. So, we can replace S1 with I1 V1. We can replace S2 with I2 V2 in that there. And rearranging that, we can end up with the current. The voltage ratio is equal to the inverse of the current ratio. So when we talk about a step-up transformer, 
we step voltage up from 10 volts to 20. If you step volt, what that bit is saying is, if you step voltage up, current will go down. If you step voltage down, current will go up. Therein lies the main reason why they step the voltage up really high on the national grid, is because it reduces the current significantly. Okay, so what you need to remember when you look at the full, the full equation for ideal transformer, which is something that you've probably all come across at some point in the past, N1 over N2, the turns ratio, is equal to V1 over V2, the voltage ratio, is equal to I2 over I1. Always remember the current is the opposite way up to the other two. And then you can't go wrong. The current is inverse to the other two ratios. And you're all happy that N is the number of turns, V is the voltage, I is the current. Yeah? Everyone happy so far? So, about the assumptions for an ideal transformer. Before we can consider what the losses are in a real one, we need to know what a, uh, it's easier to work that out and look at that when you know what you're assuming, if you say it's ideal. So before I'm undertaking the study of practical commercial transformers, I need to examine the properties of so-called ideal. By definition, an ideal transformer has the following properties. It has no losses due to core heating, eddy currents, or the resistance of the windings. Yeah. So an ideal transformer doesn't get hot, no matter how much current you pass through it, no matter what the frequency is, and so on. It doesn't resist current in any way, okay, and there are no eddy current losses. Secondly, its core is infinitely permeable. And in terms of that, we don't mean permeable to water, we mean it's permeable to a magnetic field. It will support as much magnetic field as you want to apply to it. It will accept unlimited flux. Thirdly, we make the assumption for ideal transformer that the coupling between primary and secondary is perfect. So any flux produced by the primary is completely linked to the secondary and vice versa, i.e. There is no leakage flux of any kind. And we come back to leakage flux a bit later on, perhaps next week. Okay? With these assumptions in place, the apparent power supplied for the primary will be equal to the apparent power delivered to the secondary, i.e. the transformer is 100% efficient. Okay? Now, little tip, you may well be asked to discuss or say something about what the assumptions are made for an ideal transformer in the examination at some point. Okay? It won't be in the formula sheet. So, example. Step down transformer. Electrical system requires an output voltage of 120 volts AC. The input voltage to the site is 14.4 kV AC. What is the required turns ratio of the transformer to achieve this voltage step down? It's part A. Okay. So, turns ratio is N1 over N2. There. From that equation, we know that the turns ratio must equal the voltage ratio. And so it's 1440 V1 over 120 V2 gives us a ratio of 120 to 1. So 
we'd have to wind this ideal transformer. If we put 10 turns on the secondary, we'd need to put 1,200 turns on the primary, in theory. Okay? Second part of the question, if the second recurrent is 500 amps, what is the primary current? So again, primary current, we use the version of the formula I1 over I2 is equal to V2 over V1. They are opposite way up. This comes up here. So it's N2 over N1. I use the ratios there. It don't matter which. You could have done that. You could do that with the voltage or the uh, turns ratio. And the answer is uh, 4.17 amps. Okay. So you could, you could, you, you, I've used the uh, turns ratio in the example. You could also use the voltage ratio. C, assuming an ideal transformer, confirm the conservation of power. So we're going to confirm it. That means we're going to multiply the um, primary voltage, 14,400, with the primary current. It's 120 times. Uh, the, and the, this side is the secondary voltage in the secondary current, and they both equal um, 60,000. There. Okay. So, given um, a small amount of information about an ideal transformer situation, you can calculate other values using the full ratio formula. So, let's have a look at this one together. An ideal transformer has 1,200 turns in the primary, 300 on the secondary, the supply to the voltage EG, generate a voltage of 400 volts. Load Z is a pure resistance of 12 ohms. To calculate the voltage secondary E2, secondary current I2, the primary current I1, and the apparent power delivered to the secondary load in VA. Okay, so how are we going to start that then? How are we going to calculate E2? What have we been given? We've got N1, 1200 turns. We've got N2, 300 turns. We've got E1, 400 volts, and we've got Z, 12 ohms. So that's the values we've got. What can we use there to give us the secondary voltage? So we've got a race, there are two ratios, our... Um, Turns ratio and our voltage ratio. One little tip is, depending on what you're looking to find, we're looking to find E2 here, is write, the, write these so that the way up you want them. Because you can, you can equally write N2 over N1 as equal to E2 over E1. We're looking for E2, so let's put E2 on top. Just, get, just a little tip, instead of writing the two ratios that way up, we're looking for E2, let's put it on the top. So the ratios are the opposite way up, all we've done is, inv in, is inverted both fractions, so they're still equal to each other. We can now easier rearrange that loop, can't we, because we can do it in one go. Yeah. Yeah, so on E1, N1, uh, sorry, N2 over N1. Yep. Yeah. 
then put the numbers in 400 times 300 over 1200 equals. Okay, Hundred volts. Does that look about right? Our ratio is four or one. We started off with four hundred and we got a hundred. Looks about right then, doesn't it? Quarter of. Yeah. B secondary current. How are we gonna do that? Uh, yeah. It's the only way you've got no other current, so you can't use the ratios here. It's well spotted. That's why you've been given the impedance that's been connected. So we we're going to use what then, um, Tom? What's the law we're using? Yeah. By Ohm's law, I I two is E two over Z. Yeah, that's what you're saying, isn't it? So that's a hundred volts over the twelve ohms equals. Eight and a third, then yeah, amps. Okay. Now, how are we going to find the primary current? Yeah, so you're going to use, we're looking for I1, so we use the current ratio. Which other which other ratio would you use? Yeah, you can you could do that. These numbers are pretty even. One general tip about engineering problems is I always say if you can use values you've been given rather than values you've calculated and possibly rounded. So in this case, voltage would be okay. And because there ain't been any rounding gone on, I'd be perfect in this case. But actually, you've been given exact values of the two numbers of turns. Therefore, that would be the favoured one. All right. And what we got to remember about the other ratios in turn in, in, compared to the current one, they're inverse. So we have to go n2 over n1. Yeah. Therefore, I1 is and I2 was 8 and a third times N2, 300, divided by N1, 1200. Count up or down? <coughs> Before you calculate it, what did voltage do? Go down. Current should. Fingers crossed it does. Answer. about a quarter of what the um, secondary current is. And the last part of the question was determine the apparent power delivered to the secondary load in VA. D, 
Pastor is E2I2 100 times 8 and a third 833 watts sorry not watts VA 833 yep and you could check that but you what should we get if we multiply the primary voltage by the primary current the primary which should for an ideal transformer be the same yeah so if you do 400 volts times 2.08 Get more or less the same. 